Hey, welcome back to Neckbeardia. Today we have for you an RPG horror story that Neck wants me to read. The title's a bit of a doozy. Uh, you have to hire rapists because all sailors are rapists. It's gonna be a good one. This was my first in-person D&D experience and a complete nightmare. Started the new game with 5 players plus DM. I was the only player with any tabletop experience, roll 20, but happy to share my love of the game. My girlfriend was also playing for the first time, and one of the players was DM's girlfriend. <laughs> bingo bingo. I was friends slash co-workers with everyone but the DM. The DM told us it would be D&D 5e with some light homebrew changes to make roleplay more fun, and a sandbox campaign. RP and combat would be balanced. At session zero, he refused to help anyone develop characters and sighed heavily whenever he was asked questions. Oh, the life of a DM is so cruel, helping out your players. I got the newbies through the process and made a balanced party, and handed over the character sheets. The DM then passed out our real character sheets. He explained that D&D has too many rules and is too boring, so he is adding in rules from Magic the Gathering. Our new sheets were three pages long and detailed a complex set of custom magic with a token system to cast them. Some of the spells literally stated that anything you can describe happening will happen. What can possibly go wrong there? My level 1 Barbarian had access to 20 homebrewed spells, which were more powerful than even high level spells in D&D. We stared baffled at the sheets until the DM told us to go home and study and meet back for session 1. Obviously this was a huge red flag and not the kind of game I was hoping to play, but the DM stated that he wouldn't play with 3 players, so if my girlfriend and I stopped, it would end the game. I felt obligated to try and make it work for my friends. We played six nightmare three hour sessions. I'll try to summarize the fuckery in small paragraphs as best as I can. The DM and his girlfriend began to bring their young four to five year old daughter who had a severe speech impediment. She found D&D &D extremely boring and was constantly disruptive. She was sweet, but her boredom made her distracting. They didn't bring toys or an iPad or anything, so she would just sit and stare at us or run around the table. Because of her speech impediment, I could not understand her to interact with her and help. The DM refused to find a sitter and she came to most sessions. The DM's favorite part of the game was puzzles. He would design elaborate complex machines for us to solve without visual aids. Solutions usually involve gripping and manipulating objects in a very specific way and specific order. For example, the second of four parts to solve a puzzle was to grip a metal bar sticking out of a machine and rotate it counterclockwise while applying pressure downwards. The DM would give no input, would just say, that didn't work, dozens of times. We literally spent two full sessions completely stuck on the same puzzle while an NPC taunted us. We only fought an enemy once in the entire campaign, session 5, after we begged for a fight. My barbarian attacked with a sword and the DM got mad I didn't use my spells and made my attacks miss. The RP was complicated and involved multiple dimensions, a whirlwind of locations and people. It was a little hard for me to keep track of the plot as a veteran sci-fi fan, and the newer players found the story confusing and intimidating. Most NPCs were roleplayed to be snobby, condescending, and better than the PCs in every way. Sounds like self-projection from the DM. The DM became progressively obsessed with my girlfriend's character, an Azimer. He constantly described her angelic features with much more detail than anyone else. He gave her special powers and went out of his way to protect her character in RP situations. He made her character integral to the plot, the main character. He made a Blender 3D model of her character but didn't model anyone else's. My girlfriend and the DM's girlfriend both expressed that they felt uncomfortable by his attention. He finally toned it down around session 5. Simp. 
The DM would write up long notes, three plus pages single spaced, in between sessions to summarize what happened. In these notes he would change what actually happened during gameplay to better match his story. Many changes were significant. He would get upset if our RP matched previous sessions instead of his changes. The DM attached an NPC to our party to railroad the story. The character was stronger, smarter, richer, etc. than our characters and got special privileges. When we ditched this NPC and expressed our concerns about it, he waited a session, then added a replacement. The new DMPC was a ship captain controlling an interdimensional ship, and we needed him for the ship to work. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is Elemental Games. Elemental Games is the largest seller of tabletop role-playing related products in the UK, and they also sell to most other countries at a great price. With 15-25% to off Games Workshop products, it's hard to say no. However, they sell a lot more than just Games Workshop products. They sell every popular war game you can think of, as well as board games, card games and role-playing games. Thinking about picking up an airbrush and trying some new painting techniques? Or what about sprucing up your gaming table and getting some new terrain and battle maps? Then consider getting it with Elemental Games. But enough of that. Let's get back to the video. The DM began to make us go in the brothels to speak with NPCs and introduce new NPCs as rapists. We, as a table of players, expressed discomfort at role-playing with people that are openly rapists. We asked if he could tone down the rape. <laughs> Could you tone down the rape, please? When you gotta ask your DM to tone down the rape, just fucking <laughs> pop smoke and get the fuck out of that game. Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, hey, Bob, could you tone down the rape, bud? Thanks. I was the only male player. Tried to explain, look, dude, you're creeping everyone out. The DM doubled down. And in the final session we played, he insisted that we needed to hire a crew of sailors to man the ship. But the sailors had to be rapists. He said, you have to hire rapists because all sailors... <laughs> you have to hire rapists because all sailors are rapists. We stared back in stunned silence. Shortly after that, his girlfriend complained about yet another puzzle where she didn't rotate a torch 45 degrees to the right and push it in to open a hidden door after wrestling with it for 5 minutes, describing every way of pushing the torch except the correct way. The DM exploded at her, and they had a giant screaming fight across the table about this puzzle. I grabbed my girlfriend and took this opportunity to leave and never returned. The game fell apart without us. As a parting shot, the DM messaged me he is quitting tabletop gaming because I have forever spoiled it for him by ruining his perfect story he has been writing for years. Good riddance you neckbeard fuck. <laughs> Good riddance you neckbeard fuck, I agree. <laughs> After leaving, I beat myself up for not quitting sooner. I kept hoping my polite suggestions would be heard and the game would improve. I felt a social pressure I've never felt before to continue the game and I let it go on for too long. I learned a lot from this experience. I learned that bad game is worse than no game. I won't feel pressured to keep doing something I hate for my friends' sake ever again. I was afraid that quitting would leave a bad taste for D&D &D for my girlfriend, but she left frustrated and eager to play a good game. It felt cathartic to write out this ordeal I went through a few years ago. I'm soon to start a new campaign with a group once COVID dies out a bit more. Let's take it on down to the comments section. Hashtag not all sailors. I'm almost scared to ask, but was he doing all the rape stuff in front of his four-year-old child? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. For what it is worth, she was so bored with the game that I don't think she was listening to those sections. The fight at the end was pretty scary for her though, and we only left after confirming the player hosting the game was comforting her in another room. 
Was he going for bad DM bingo? Because he may have hit every single fucking square. Broken homebrew? Check. Flirting with players? Check. Rape? Check. Normalizing rape? Check. Railroading? Check. Author syndrome railroading? Check. Arrogant NPCs? Check. Bad and overpowered DMPC? Checky check check. Unsolvable puzzles? Kinda check. Gaslighting? Check. Belief in own perfection? Check. Angry at players for not being railroaded? Check. Fetishes? Check. Bad broken encounters? Check. Despite there only being one combat encounter. Racism? Maybe. That depends on whether an Azimer fetish, which excluded non azimer as less attractive, can be considered racism. Sexism? Possibly. That depends on whether fetishes and flirting inherently count as sexism as well. Pushing real life politics on players? Not check. Idiotic assertions about a given demographic? Check. Sailors. <laughs> Punishing players for their race slash class choices. Check. Barbarians use melee weapons. Thanks to you Dusty Scrolls for pointing that out. Did I miss anything? He definitely got bingo several times over, but he didn't hit every RPG horror story's classic trope. Just most of them. For what it's worth, my girlfriend is Asian. I'm white, as was everyone else at the table. She felt that his attention towards her was a racially driven creep show. <laughs> my lady. <laughs> You're just like my anime wife. <laughs> I myself didn't feel like he was flirting with her so much as with her character. Like he was super hung up on her being a perfect beautiful angel. I left that out of the OP because I wanted to stick to the facts. There's a million more things that happen across these sessions. I'll ask my girlfriend when she gets home from work if she remembers any other particularly egregious moments. Just wanted to add, you summing all that up helps me see how ridiculous this was. I've been reading D&D horror stories online for decades, and living this one was like a bad dream. I swear, it all happened as I described it without embellishment, and many more tiny things. After the second DMPC was added, we watched Matt Mercer's video on DMPCs and pretty much everything he was describing was what the two we had were doing. We had to listen to a 10 minute monologue about how our rapist captain heroically navigated his ship single handedly through transdimensional currents while our characters watched in wordless awe. Just remembering the horrified side-eye glances from the other players during that speech makes me want to barf. Working on for years is such code for RP my book for me. I have a world that I have been working on for years through many campaigns, etc. But the only thing I bring into a new game is the world setting, the background the players play in front of. When session zero comes up, despite my world building, I'm always, crap, I have to make a game. How did you know all the sailors were rapists? Did they introduce themselves that way? What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a rapist, you? During their description of physical appearance, they would be described as a rapist or looking like a rapist. Other characters would tell us they are a rapist and get offended at any negative reaction. Others would just talk about how they like to rape. It never got more graphic than that, thankfully. Still not sure if I would have said, okay, we're leaving, or if I would have gotten into it with this creep. What a selfish, selfish DM. He would have turned me off with the bait and switch. If you as a DM aren't honest enough to go with what you pitch, then change things to some god complex bullshit you pull out of your ass with no input allowed, it's probably going to be a RPG horror story game. He used an established system, 5e, with a decent rep for being fun and somewhat balanced to bring people in. Now, I understand people want to develop new systems, it's how all games, even D&D itself, came into existence, but all these systems were transparent with documentation given to playtesters. Playtesters also knew they were playtesting. Gygax didn't say, 
I've got a medieval war game here. Show up at my house in Lake Geneva at 6. Then whip out dragon minis and spell sheets and make people start RPing when they wanted a tactical match of knights, pikemen, and archers. No, he told them. Gygax also listened and made tweaks if things didn't work. Nor did the creators of Magic the Gathering say, Hey, we have a poker game at 8. Then proceed to hand out index cards with drawings on them and handwritten rules. Those people knew. Agree 100%. The new players had just finished watching things like Harmon Quest and Critical Role and were eager to play cliche D&D roles, dive into dungeons, roleplay tavern brawls, and roll some dice. When he broke out the Magic the Gathering rules, we were all collectively like, what the fuck is this? The DM was the only player that had ever played Magic the Gathering. I still know next to nothing about it myself. And then a few sessions in said we had used the system too long and couldn't change back. I think I rolled a die maybe five times in the entire campaign. And I could get down to play some friendly make-believe without any dice. But then I would need even a tiny amount of autonomy as a player. You know who we need? We need D&D Shakespearean Monkey. As the Game Master, it is not about you nor your own wishes. You are the weaver of tales, the conductor of the story which the players bring to life. Those who join in your game are the true objective of which you should strive. Their laughter is the symphony, their smiles the stage lights, and their characters the actors for the wild play before you all. Your feelings, your desires, are secondary to their joy by some asshole who calls himself guard bro all right that's the end no more soppy wet shit if you like this story and others like them be sure to like and subscribe to neck beardy as well as click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week and get all those nice alerts if you like original stories written by me stop by guard beardy and check out the veil rider or emily bronze series all written through the week fresh off the press just for your ears with both me narrating and the bell damn narrating person i found on fucking behind the voice acting she's doing a great job but until we see you next time on this side of the veil this has been guard bro and this is nick beardia